we're in hurricane season, right? And you see the storm clouds, you know, for Friday and Saturday, we've had them swirling around. But the kid in Hope County that actually took a video of the one right over his house and then it was turning and you can hear the howling. And you think about that sound like the blowing of a violent wind, not just a wind, but a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. All right, what's all this noise? What's going on here? They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire lashing out that, that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were what filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Let me tell you what happened here. They had church. They gathered together like he had told them to and wanted them to be together. He, he called them together, 13, and, and one thing they added. And he had the group, and, and you need to grow this, and you need to share this. And all of a sudden they get there, and here's something amazing happens. This fire fills. I said earlier, you hear a song like Rattle, and you, you want, I want to knock things over. I really do. We ever get like a mega church, I'm just going to break things every Sunday. We'll just pay to replace them. I, it, there are Sundays when I want to, this doesn't sound right. This doesn't sound very pastoral. I finish my sermon, I want to fight somebody. And I don't mean fight them like in a physical fight unless they want to physically fight. I mean, I want to spiritually share what's important, and that's Jesus Christ. I'm tired of sometimes sitting around and you feel like, man, we walk through as believers and we're, they're, they're, they're screaming at the mountaintop, their side of it, aren't they? Society screams loudly their perspective. What we're doing wrong. Bible's a hate crime. You can't preach the word of God. You can't, all these things, they're telling us, not one of you have gone out this week and screamed. You can't, we're not doing that. But sometimes we need to do that. And God was stirring them. And here's all of a sudden, if you have any question about what it means to speak in tongues, in this scripture, what he's speaking is languages that they can understand. They were all from the same kind of Galilean people. And all of a sudden, people from far, and Jerusalem was kind of one of those melting pots of people from all over the world, and every language was being spoken. And they're like, wait, wait a minute. All of a sudden, DDJ comes in one Sunday, and all of a sudden, he starts speaking German. We're like, whoa, DDJ. And then we look around, and Robert's going off in some Swahili or something. And everybody's speaking that. And guess what? Somebody needed to hear that. I've always read it as there was somebody to hear it. But here's what's also important. That he wants his word, his power, to be spoken in all languages. We'll hear later in the Bible about go out to all Judea and Samaria and we hear those things and we talk about those things. He's telling you it doesn't matter. Your language, your ethnicity, where you're from, your cultural bias, I can speak in your language. We need to take a little cue from this scripture right here. We don't always need to speak in churches to people that don't know what church is about. You don't always need to speak in condemnation to somebody who is hurting and needs salvation, not condemnation. We don't need to speak down. We need to speak in their language. And all of a sudden they were filled, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in everybody's tongues, and they, they understood it. Together, they were all filled. Together, they were all filled. How many only come on church mostly on Sundays? That's fine. Don't, don't feel bad. You don't have to raise your hand if you know that. But statistically, they're saying the church is now twice a month. That's a, that's a faithful goer. Wow. We grew up, it was church on Sunday. Church had church on Sunday night. Visitation on Tuesday night. Prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Sad thing, and I'm just going to be honest with you, when I started the church and we, we tried on Sunday night, and all of a sudden you look around, there are very few churches that do Sunday nights anymore. They call it family night. That's fine. I understand that. We grew up, Sunday night was our family night. We knew we were, we were going to watch Disney, Mutual of Omaha. It just kind of rolled off. And then whenever the Sunday night movie came on ABC, which is what we thought was kind of risque, we would have to go to bed and mom and dad would watch the Sunday night movie. <laughs> we are like, TV, I was like, oh, there's going to be a murder scene. Ah! Now you watch regular TV and you're like, oh, glory, that's not what we used to watch. But together they were filled. Robert didn't know that he was going to be part of the sermon today. And, and, and you speak things, and, and I hear them, and I hear God speaking. And yesterday, he wasn't so happy and joyful about being by himself. I understand that, Robert. That's hard, right? 
And sometimes we feel, and we'll go through our week, and you may be around people, but you feel alone. How many's ever been around people, but you feel absolutely alone? There are times at work I'm around thousands of people, but I feel completely alone. And then that moment, I'm thinking, where can I get fully filled up? And that's when we're together. Tuesday night, our men's group and our, our ladies' groups, I'm telling you, are, it fills me. Eddie would always say, it fills you to get to the next day. And you hear people say, midweek gets you to the Sunday. And you, you come together, every Sunday that we come together, I'm filled. My student asked me this morning, so what kind of responsibility do you have to your people that they meet? And how do you feel towards them every Sunday? And my answer is kind of this, and I know it sounds like I'm trying to be nice to y'all, and I am a nice guy, but I'm not just trying to be nice to y'all. This is as important to me as it is to you as the people. The sheep always think, well, that's where we're getting fed. The shepherd, that's where he's feeding. And because of what God's placed in his heart, he feels like this is what I want to do. And I am completely filled by you guys receiving the message hearing the praise and worship, and praying together. It excites me to see y'all together. It excites me to hear people pray and have the, the ladies take over on Wednesday night and dad and them to teach on a Tuesday night and everybody to step up and, and all those things. It excites me because together we are awesome. Together we feel, man, we're invincible. We're the church. And now the little church is not the poor wall. It's the people. I know that. People always tell me you don't have to go to church to go to heaven. Amen. You don't. But I can't make it a week or two without the church. Amen. I don't know how you do life trusting in Jesus, but you're not with his people. I'm the most gifted athlete at some sport, but I never attempt that sport. Why? I'm the best at this, but I never, I'm an amazing singer, but I never sing with or for people. Why? Like-mindedness is a beautiful thing. When we're amongst some like-minded people, we feel confident, secure. We're supposed to be like-minded with Christ. I shouldn't be around Christ and feel condemned. I should be excited. That's what Pentecost is about. He swarms over them. He fills them. And together they're excited. Verses 14 and 15 as I jump forward. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. You talking about a sermon? If you ever want to go back and you, they tell you what sermon would you like to hear, this would be the sermon I want to be at. I was asked in that interview today, who do you listen to? And dad, and he, they know this. My family knows this really well. Who are the leaders in your religion that you listen to and get guidance from? And I go, Jesus. I've heard some amazing preachers. And don't get me wrong, when an amazing preacher, when I, when I sit and I hear them share the word of God in a way, it motivates in me and moves me. But in my understanding and my trust, I want to hear Jesus say it. They have gathered together. Jesus is not with them anymore. They're on their own. They're on this gig. And all of a sudden, Peter steps up and he says, Fellow Jew, Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you something. Please do. There's fire going off. There's people speaking in tongues. I need you to do some. you got some explaining to do, right? I can remember in this church, standing right like this. The most Holy Spirit-filled moment we've ever had in the history of Hope We Were One Accord had nothing to do with me or God. You're saying, what do you mean? I stood right here, and I can remember looking out and seeing the King family, Andrea and Jeffrey King, and I remember Andrea's face, and it got real, whoa, and she screamed out, and then somebody else screamed out, I'm like, Holy Spirit is falling heavy amongst these people, and I said it out loud, either you've received the fullness of the Spirit, or there's a rat coming out of the wall, and there was a rat coming out of the wall, and there a hole right up there. And he would come out and listen to the sermon a little bit, and he'd look around. And then he'd run to another hole, and it, the, I was like, I thought, the day the squirrel went berserk, right? I was sitting there thinking, man, I am preaching like nobody today. I'm on fire. And a rat took the whole thing, right? Made me feel like Disney. But let me explain to you this. Here's what you need to know. Listen carefully to what I said, he said. These men are not drunk as you suppose them to be. I want you to hear this because Peter's rectifying 
their thoughts and their prejudices. We see it quickly when we pass it, but here's what Peter's saying. I need to tell you what everyone else is thinking about you. They are not drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 in the morning. That's why we have a song. It's 5 o'clock somewhere, right? They, they, it's not. It's 9 in the morning. Here's what Peter understood. Together, they were judged. Bullying is when you isolate somebody and you repetitively or con constantly, consistently picking on them or, or, or being mean to them. That's bullying. It's not a one-time event. Oh, bam. Oh, it's constantly. It has to be repeated, repeated. It has to be a pattern. It has to keep going. Listen, when that person is bullied, it's usually an individual that's picked out and isolated from the crowd. And they get picked on. And guess what the rest of the crowd does? It joins in. They were sitting there and they were being judged. As Christians, if you are alone in your walk and understanding, you might feel isolated and bullied by the world. But together, Peter explains their judgment. He is saying to them, guess who's wrong? Not the people on fire. Not the people speaking in tongues. Not the people that are all swooning and everything else. But you that look at them like they're crazy, you're the one that's wrong. You've already judged them because they're doing something amazing. They're doing exactly what God has called them to do. And I'm telling you, you're going to be judged because you believe in Jesus Christ. The student interviewed me this morning. So perfect timing. Thank you, Lord, for that. Asked me, have you ever been oppressed or uh, attacked for your religion? No, I've never had to get out and all of a sudden people are throwing stuff in my car. Beth, you're in. They're hitting me or fighting me. I've never had that. But I told that young student, and I said, but I've had opportunities where people wouldn't talk to me. I can remember moving back to Plain City thinking, man, I know a lot of people in Plain City. Got a lot of high school buddies and college buddies. Look around you. They're not in this room. Most of them have never been in my church or heard me preach the word of God. I can remember playing basketball with them all the time at the YMCA. And I can remember saying and hearing them talk as they would run off away from me and say things like, hey, y'all want to get together this weekend? Hey, you want to do this? How was this thing? And they're inviting things. And all of a sudden, I'd look over. I wasn't worried that they didn't invite me, but I heard that. Every one of you might hear sometimes when somebody goes, well, don't, don't invite Randy. He's like religious. And they laugh. Don't, don't even try with him. He's not going to drink that or do that. Don't, don't waste your time. And then they'll go and defend themselves. They'll say, he's all self-righteous. No, I'm not self-righteous. I'm righteous because of Jesus Christ. So I am righteous. I'm just not myself. I'm not choosing it. He chose it for me. Together, they were judged. I can imagine Peter, his, his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, went to the cross and was crucified for his convictions. And now you got some crazy folk preaching and sharing the word of God and they're filled with the Holy Spirit and he doesn't look around and go, hey, let me, let me explain to them. They're really not trying to hurt you. They're not going really to impose their religious understanding on you. We sometimes will apologize for believing in Jesus Christ. We will sometimes say, well, I'll just take the high road and say, well, listen, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to pray in the name of Jesus. I was asked one time, the very first time I was ever asked to pray at school, are you going to use his name? Yeah. I, I do it every single time. Well, you know, it's kind of easier if you don't say his name. And you all know, you've heard people pray and they write it out real night, in the name of that guy upon high. And they won't say the name of Jesus because they don't want to offend somebody. They're not the ones judging the other people. The people that heard and didn't understand are judging them. Peter said, let me explain. They not drunk. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the scripture, and it never ever came to fruition, but I'll tell you, because y'all know me very well. I think Pastor Kimberly really talked me off the ledge on this one, but I wanted so badly at one time in our church history to give everybody shot glasses with a cross on it. 
I can see that I was going to disperse shot glasses to everybody. They'd be like, why the pastor? Because my thought was, if you can look at a shot glass with Jesus Christ and know the Holy Spirit, and you can still drink, you got some dealings to do. <laughs> if you're the one on Friday night taking shots from the Christian church class, you got some more work to do. We have not given out the shot glasses yet. Together they were judged, and God, through Peter, said, don't worry about their judgment. You're all together. I have filled you. They just don't know it yet. In verse 42, he kind of pulls it together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Many, many, many pastors sit around and try to figure out what they're supposed to do with their church. Five-year, ten-year plan. I was there. When we first started the church, we went to church basically. Basic training. They had a church camp for us. They told us this is what you got to do. They told us this is how much money you got to raise. And the number was close to one hundred to two hundred thousand dollars. Never had that, but we started anyway. There are a lot of things that they taught us that we should be doing. The scripture tells us what we're supposed to be doing. Same last slide. Next last slide. Together, here's what they did. They learned. Many of you have Bible studies on your own. Yeah, I am faithful. Mom reads hers. Kim and I get in and do our Psalms and Proverbs. Sometimes we'll take something else and we'll start studying. I love my Tuesday night because we're studying the Word of God. And we learn. But I'm telling you, there's nothing better than learning together. Every one of you has had that class where you had to do it by yourself. Study this, but you get study groups. It's kind of crazy that we do it in our education realm, but we think it doesn't transition over to our spiritual realm. I'm going to learn all by myself. Now to learn together. That's why I went to seminary. I learned with a bunch of people. Do I believe you have to go to seminary to pastor church? No. Did it help me? Amen. God knew my ignorance and my bullheadedness and he told me clearly. He didn't let me tiptoe around. Should I? No, he told me. He said, Randy, you're going to go to seminary. This is one I heard clearly. And I told my wife, you're going to go to seminary, and when you graduate, you'll plant a church. We graduated in May, and we started the church in June. I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. They learned, and they learned together, and they fellowship together. We fellowship really well. Y'all put a smile on and love being here. I don't see angst among you. I've said I've never seen a knife fight in the church. I've never had to break up a brawl. Might have heard a little things going back and forth, but we fellowship well together. We broke bread. How many like breaking bread? Amen. Pastor breaks some bread. I like breaking some bread. You tell me I can't break bread anymore. I'm like, that's not religious. I gotta break bread. That's why a little carb diet kind of worries me. I gotta break some bread. You know what I'm saying? They broke bread. They ate together. I know you think that sounds simple for a lot of people. Just eating together is a challenge. We've had people in our church that I'm not. I can't eat out in public. And then they do. Because guess what happens? It's no longer in public. You're in your family. And we have family meals together. And guess what they did? They prayed. They not only did these things, they devoted themselves to that. They devoted. When you devote yourself to something, you've almost taken a pledge or an oath that I am going to devote myself to to cancer research. I'm going to devote myself to bettering the human race. I'm going to devote myself to world peace. I'm going to devote myself to seeing these beauty pageants. What do you want to do? I want to change the world. I'm going to devote myself. If you don't do it, you're not devoted. If you choose something else, you definitely weren't devoted. They devoted themselves to learning about God, fellowshipping with God's people, breaking bread together, and praying all together. I told you the sermon's title was Pentecost, not Pentecost, because together they did not coast. They didn't. They had learned the errors of their ways when Jesus was gone and in the tomb three days and hiding and isolating themselves. They no longer wanted to hide and isolate. They now want to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I call it the unction of the Holy Spirit. They wanted to do these things and devote their lives to doing these four things. This Pentecost we celebrate God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And we need to remind ourselves, 
Don't stop believing when it gets tough. Don't stop believing when you're by yourself. Don't stop believing when the church is maybe closed. Don't stop believing when COVID says you can't meet together. Don't stop believing when you don't feel well. Don't stop believing when you're busy. Don't stop believing because it's summer. Don't stop believing. Do not coast and always devote yourselves to what God has called you to do. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another amazing day. Thank you, Lord, for just allowing me to share your words. I pray that if they hear nothing else, they hear you. They hear your devotion. We might question what we're devoted to in life. We might question how devoted are we. We might say sometimes in seasons we are more devoted than the others. I know my mic just went out. That's okay. May we devote ourselves to you the way you have perfectly devoted yourselves to us. Lord God, I just ask a blessing over these families.